Hello folks, I am John Najarian, and I'm lucky enough to be able to talk with stars of stage and screen and sometimes even an occasional market master. <laughs> and today uh, I'm with a budding young star. Uh, this is Harrison Rogers. Harrison is a guy that I've known since he was about that tall. Um, now he's about what, 6'3"? Yeah, 6'1", Truth <laughs> County. <laughs> Um, and Harrison is a fisherman, folks. He's only 21 years old. The guy's fished all over the planet, and he's taken people to outrageous fishing spots that he has ferreted out himself by reading about them, by watching television, YouTube, and so forth. And first thing I got to ask you, Harrison, is what really got you interested in fishing? Was it your mom, your dad? I mean, what got you interested in fishing to the degree that you are right now? You know, John, that's the first question that everyone asks you as a fisherman who got you into it. Yep. And oddly enough, it was not really my parents that got me into it. It was my aunt. It was up here in this very spot in southern Michigan. Mm -hmm. Beach walk right down the road there was the first place I ever cast a line. Little <laughs> corn, little hot dog, mm -hmm. bluegill and catfish. And the second my, my aunt and uncle took me to that dock, I was hooked literally and, phys and figuratively. <laughs> Wow. Oh my God. That's the biggest steelhead I've caught in some time, you guys. As I said, I know you have fished up in Alaska, fished Lake Michigan all over the place, and I've got some great stories I want you to dive into about that. Fished Florida. Yeah. Um, I imagine parts of the Gulf Coast and things like that. Um, first of all, do you have a preference? I mean, do you like warm water, cold water? Do you like oceans versus lakes? What's your real fort or what would be, you know, the area that if you could only fish one place, where would it be? You know, when I was first starting out, the ultimate experience was steelhead fishing. Mm. And the reason for that is right where we are, Michigan City, Indiana has the largest steelhead run, artificial steelhead run really anywhere in the world. 40 years ago, the alewives started flooding the beaches of Lake Michigan. I'm sure you remember. Mm -hmm. You couldn't go to the beach without smelling that horrible smell. So they took Columbia River Selmonids, kings, coho, steelhead, and they stocked them in Lake Michigan. And now, in some places, they naturally reproduce, and we have a thriving ecosystem. So for all these fishermen that fish the Great Lakes, you can go to the docks, you can go to the piers, and you can catch these magnificent steelhead that skyrocket six feet out of the water with a bait in their mouth take off like a Ferrari attached to your line. <laughs> and you can do it right here. So Lake Michigan would be one of your top spots then? It was the, Lake Michigan was the place that brought me to experience kind of the ultimate sport, sport fish in the steelhead trout. As my fishing has evolved, oceanic fishing has really taken my heart. I mean, to, to catch sort of these ultimate saltwater game fish species, kubara, snapper, tarpon, sailfish, spearfish, those fish, when they pick up your bait, I mean, they, they put an excitement into you that I can't describe, not even a Lake Michigan steelhead could do. Do you throw them back on occasion, like especially some of those game fish or sport fish and things like that? When you pursue any sort of fish, it's an adversary, but it's also a companion. And you grow to have a tremendous respect for those fish. And with that respect comes conservation practices and love. So oftentimes I do try to release fish when I can. There are mm -hmm. certain fisheries that you experience, yellowfin tuna, bluefin tuna, wahoo, yellowtail, and you go out on long range fishing boats in San Diego and a guy would look at you like you were crazy if, if you, you threw wanted it to throw it back, yeah. you know? But um, I do, especially with the salmonids, I try to release most of my fish. Alaska, I know you've been there several times. Yeah. Up in Alaska, that's a whole different kind of salmon. Um, related, of course, to the salmon you spoke of that right. they stocked Lake Michigan with. But man, those are awesome looking fish, especially when they're running up to spawn and the, the nose gets all oh, yeah. curved. and The kite. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what is it like catching those fish up there in Alaska? Well, let me start by saying I could fish in a sewer. Okay? <laughs> so aesthetic value of the environment around me is not the number one priority mm -hmm. but when you think of alaska you think of the last frontier you think of gorgeous trees gorgeous meandering rivers mountain peaks eagles you think of of a free place that's completely wild mm -hmm. and that is what you experience when you go to those lodges and those rivers in alaska it's such a vast state southeast is nothing like central or west or east i mean every fishery is so unique 
So to catch those massive kings mm -hmm. or those big coho and those beautiful silty blue streams, it's unbelievable. It's a different experience. And you're competing at that stage. I mean, and the, the animal that you're competing with um, is one of the largest carnivores on earth, maybe the largest carnivore on earth. You know, whether it's a Kodiak or whether it's a grizzly, the bears that fish up there are probably not all that friendly <laughs> to humans, right? You know, you get They don't like competition. No, they don't. But the good news is there's so many fish, there's enough to go around. You don't really <laughs> have to worry about them for the most part. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the first time I ever went up there, there's the Kenai River, which is one of the most famous rivers in Alaska because it has the biggest king salmon pretty much anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. But they have a tremendous sockeye run as well, call, call them reds. And at the Kenai River and the Russian River confluence, there's a ferry. And it's a rite of passage to go over to that ferry. The last one ends at 10 p.m. at night. You go with a bunch of little poppers and you stay until the next ferry at 6 a.m. in the morning. And the bears will come behind you and you'll hear them rustling in the brush and you'll have to throw those poppers to scare them away. <laughs> and my first trip ever down there, there are, there are prime holes that are better real estate on the river than others. So every fisherman kind of inches towards those holes. And I'm sitting there and I'm fishing and I'm flipping for sockeye. And I hear everyone start to say, hey bear, hey mama, hey bear. And people start slowly moving left. And I'm like, I didn't really hear the bear part. I just kind of heard the shouting. So I was moving left into that spot, focusing on getting in that hole. And by the time I turned around, I was the only one in eyesight of the river. <laughs> and I'm sitting in this hole. I'm like, this is sweet. This is nothing like it should be. And I hear the brush start to crackle behind me. And like a juvenile brown bear comes sprinting out and grabs a sockeye right in front of me in the river. <laughs> and I'll never forget that experience. Oh, I bet. And they, I bet. they come back. They're like, you know that that bear walked right behind you, kid. And I was like, well, I guess I was focused on the fish like him. <laughs> Good thing we both were. Now, when you were um, in the sixth grade, you started taking friends on fishing tours, I'll call it. Yeah. I don't know what you called it. <laughs> Maybe you called it that. I called it a fish camp. Okay, a fish camp. Yeah. So you took friends up to Alaska yeah. to go fishing. Um, and you took friends down to the Gulf Coast, down to uh, Florida, and of course here to Lake Michigan. That's right. Tell me a little bit about that. How do you start off? I mean, yeah, you see somebody like Jeremy Wade on TV, you know, with yeah. river monsters or whatever, ocean creatures, whatever his newest show is. But yeah. you see these crazy fishermen on TV, and all of a sudden that bug bites you, and you're that guy, and you're out there. But now you're taking your friends um, to participate with you in that kind of, um, where you're the guide. Yeah. You're showing them how it's done yeah. in the sixth grade, which by my calculation, I usually just add five years or six years to whatever the uh, grade is. So that would mean you'd be about 11 or 12 years old. Right. And you're leading the group up into Alaska. Yeah. Tell us about that. I mean, like anything else, John, it came out of necessity. I was fortunate enough when I was 9, 10 to have my first camp experiences. You go up to a lake and you sail and you canoe and you kayak and you meet friends for life. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, it didn't revolve around what I was most passionate about, which was fishing. I could have left the camping and the sailing and the tenting behind and gone mm -hmm. straight for the fish. And I looked around and no camp really existed for kids my age. So I created one. And I was lucky enough to have some really tremendous friends that joined me. And there were, there were six of us. First year we were here in Michigan, second year in Florida, third <laughs> yeah. year in Alaska. And as you say, like to be 12 years old and to start something like that, it, it, I mean, it teaches you everything. Mm -hmm. It has shown me what I want to do with my life. Fantastic. Invaluable. Well, um, I know that, uh, that your life is invaluable as well as the, that experience, but you've kind of pushed the envelope from time to time. I mean, I, I heard from your dad a story where I think it was a stand-up paddleboard, it was. and you put a an outboard on the back of it, yeah. and went out into Lake Michigan until like two in the morning or something. Tell us about first of all about why, <laughs> why a paddleboard, and then you know what happened with that trip. So you talk about pushing the envelope. Mm -hmm. Fishermen are a rare breed in that regard. They're always looking for the next coolest, greatest experience. And for me, I've caught a lot of fish in this lake. I've caught steelhead, I've caught kings. And I wanted to catch them in a way that no one had done before. And I figured, how many people have caught king salmon off of a paddleboard? 
Just you guys, it's my first sizable fish on the paddle board. I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna kill the motor. I killed it. Now I'm gonna sit down, put my feet in the water like this. Some slack, some slack, some slack. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Okay, I'm gonna lower this rod. Rod holder down. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on. Come on. Set it in like this. Set it in like this. Oh my God, we got it. This is like old man in the sea Hemingway shit. We got it. So in the early spring, I got a paddle board. I took an electric trolling motor and a 12 volt <laughs> marine battery that was waterproof, of course, and a radio. And I started trolling and I started close to shore. Close to shore proved, you know, uneventful. So I got further and further out. And I'm a little bit embarrassed to say I, <laughs> I ended up 10 miles offshore one day on this paddleboard. <laughs> Sun was setting. And somehow I managed to catch a small king salmon, about eight pounds. And that was a tremendous victory. Unfortunately, on my way back, my motor died. So I had a nice, maybe seven to eight mile paddle in the dark back <laughs> using a headlamp so boats wouldn't run me over. So was it the safest thing in the world? Maybe not, but was it epic? I would say so. Yeah, I'd say it was epic. Um, what would be like a, a fish that you've always wanted to go after in some ocean, in some lake, in some river? And if it's more than one, that's fine. But where would you like to go that you haven't been? to go for a certain fish? Would it be, you know, uh, one of those, I mean, you've already talked about tarpon, and I know, and I'm gonna ask you about that sturgeon in a minute, but um, you've caught some really big fish. Yeah. Um, what would you say would be like on your um, bucket list as far as fishing holes anywhere in the world and type of fish? I would say that the Panamanian coast has really inspired me and I've wanted to make a trip down there for a very long time. One of the most famous lodges, fishing lodges in the world, it's called Tropic Star. I think they have more world records come out of there than anywhere else. Hmm. It's right on the border of Colombia, but it is in Panama. And that area is so nutrient rich. It, it produces so many great inshore opportunities, so many great offshore opportunities, that I think to fish topwater Kubara snapper in that area of the world would be my next bucket list mm -hmm. experience. Now, I mentioned briefly about uh, sturgeon, and I know you caught an immense sturgeon mm. in a river, I think it was. Yeah. Tell, Tell us, us a little bit about why. <laughs> Were you fishing for sturgeon at that time, by the way? I was. Okay. So I had gone out with a buddy of mine every weekend fishing the Columbia River dams, which if you're unfamiliar with those dams, they're big hydroelectric dams. They have you know a variety of... Um, different uses, mainly transportation is one of the largest ones. They are hell for salmon to get past. I mean, you know, the issue there is one for another time, but the Army Corps of Engineers is under a lot of scrutiny constantly for clean salmon passage up that way. But any, anyhow, there are sturgeon throughout that entire Columbia River Basin system. And the Snake River starts way up in Idaho and it drains all the way into Washington, the Columbia, and out eventually to the Pacific Ocean. And there are true dinosaurs that live in that water. I mean, there are sturgeon in excess of 11, 12 feet in those waters. Mm. Anything over 10 foot, I mean, anything over nine foot is an exceptional fish. And I was lucky enough to meet up with an exceptional guide and Adam, Steel Dreams Guide Service, give him a shout out. And Steel, Steel, Dreams. Steel Dreams Guide Service. And I caught some rainbow trout the night before. We tied those suckers up to big, heavy Okuma rods and Shimano, excuse me, Okuma reels and Shimano rods, big 16 ounce weights. We fished eight feet of water. These, these nine foot fish are in eight feet of water on the riverbank. And we hooked up to a true dinosaur in that nine foot, 400 pound sturgeon, which remains my biggest fish to date. Oh. And uh, when you catch that fish, um, what kind of, first of all, that, I, I've seen sturgeon in rivers putting up fight. Hmm. And you know, it's not a sailfish, but they're gonna put up a little bit of a fight, especially uh -oh. the first few minutes. And he's 400 pounds. Yeah. And if I wanted to speak about sturgeon in particular, they are absolute dogs. They, they fight from the moment they're hooked to the second before you get them to a beach where they can't fight anymore. I mean, they are 150% fueled up, riled up the whole time. 
This fish in particular, the hook caught him on the outside of the mouth, so he had a little bit more maneuverability than one normally does. So that fight was an hour and a half at mm. max drag, probably 25 pounds of drag. I mean, you want to talk about pain and punishment. That was that fight in a nutshell. Yeah. Yeah. And your hands must have been raw. They don't even know that they're hooked, John. I mean, they go up river two miles at a slow pace. They go down river three miles, and you're just following them in the little skiff, in the 18-foot aluminum skiff, just on top of them, constantly apply, applying <laughs> pressure. <laughs> so at the end of that fight, what happened? Truthfully, Adam, Adam and I thought we, we might have had, you know, an 11-foot fish, like one of those true dinosaurs, the way it, it put up a fight. So if I'm being perfectly honest, we took a look at it, and it was nine foot, and we were like, dang, we don't have the record we thought we did but it was still the fish of a lifetime. So what happens is you get it on a sandbar, make sure it's in the water, breathing strong. You can't keep those fish. They're dinosaurs you wouldn't want to anyway. They live in excess of 100 years. Um, you snap a quick, a quick couple of photos and you send her back. Man, um, there, is, there are so many other questions I wanna ask, but we'll have to save them for another time. All right. Harrison Rogers, I really appreciate your time, sir. Um, I think we're going to hear a lot more about what Harrison does when he's out there going after these monsters, folks. And uh, of course, about conservation and how you can keep that sport alive by, you know, being respectful of the fish and trying to make uh, the uh, experience as available to as many people as possible, rather than having it just be an elite thing, Absolutely. which is so cool that you've done that. Thank you, Harrison. Thank you, John.